Good day and welcome to the Poultry World Seminar on uh, Gut Health, live here from uh, VRV uh, Asia in Bangkok. My name is Fabian Brockete and as the Editor-in-Chief uh, I will be the host of this, uh, this session. Uh, this session is a hybrid uh, session. We are live on the internet uh, and of course uh, here with the audience in the conference room. So a big hello to Bangkok and to the rest of the world. Today we are going to focus on the important topic of gut health. A delicate theme, uh, so to say, as a lot can go wrong uh, in the gut of our birds. That said, with paying attention, there is a lot to gain as well. A healthy gut means that the animal can process the diet more efficiently, uh, has a better immune system and is less susceptible to pathogenic bacteria and viruses. Certain feed components uh, and feed additives can positively influence uh, the microflora in the gut and in turn boost intestinal health. I have a lineup of four speakers uh, for you who will cover the different uh, aspects of ensuring a healthy gut. And just to give you a heads up, we will do some question and answer after each speaker so you can prepare. Our opening speaker of today is Roger Davin. Uh, Roger is poultry consultant and product manager at Schottast Feed Research. In his talk of today, he will focus on coccidiosis and necrotic enteritis, uh, what we can do from a nutritional point of view with coccidiostates or with alternatives to coccidiostates, for instance. Roger, the stage is yours. Here you are. All right. Thank you. Yes, yes. Good morning, everybody, and uh, welcome to my presentation. Thanks again, uh, Poultry World, for the invitation. And yeah, welcome to everybody uh, to my presentation here today. Uh, as the as the as Fabian mentioned, I was gonna I'm gonna be dealing about coccidiosis and necrotic enteritis, and what are the strategies that we can do to minimize uh, those problems on, uh, from a nutritional point of view. So I would like to start my presentation giving a little introduction. Uh, first, discussing what necrotic enteritis is. I will say it's the second most important or relevant disease in poultry. It's an intestinal inflammatory disease that leads to cell death or necrosis. That's why we are talking about necrotic enteritis. And its causative agent is Clostridium perfringens, which is a gram-positive bacterium. And usually its toxin is going to be the one giving us more issues. So uh, Clostridium perfringens is a normal inhabitant in the intestine. And usually it's located in the cecum of birds. The, but the problems occur when this bacteria overgrows in more proximal parts of the intestinal tract. However, Clostridia has issues. It cannot work by itself. It needs some help. It needs some predisposing factors or enablers. So we have enablers or predisposing factors from intestinal damage point of view, but also from nutritional point of view. From the intestinal damage uh, we could be talking about mycotoxins, but also, I'm very relevant, about coccidiosis. So an animal that has a big coccidiosis challenge will have more predisposing factors to also be affected by necrotic enteritis. And from the nutritional point of view, if we have very highly viscous diets with a lot of soluble NSPs, or diets with very high crude protein levels that will also uh, facilitate the growth of necrotic of clostridia in the small intestine. So a way to prevent one of these uh, enablers is to provide in feed coccidiosis, uh, coccidiostats, which is yeah, a pas passive method to prevent the proliferation of Aymeria species in the small intestine. However, Aymeria species can become resistant to coccidiostats. Another way to prevent coccidiosis 
is vaccination. And vaccination is a more active method to activate immune system and bu build immunity. However, this protection is species specific. So a good vaccine should have all immune species in order to protect animals to get a coccidiosis. So as I mentioned, coccidiosis is an enabler for Clostridium perfringens and so necrotic enteritis. And actually, we already investigated that quite some time ago at Schotters. Uh, so uh, we conducted a test with uh, infected mo uh, an infectious model in which we infected animals with or without coccidiostats. So we infected animals with Clostridium perfringens and when uh, the animals received a coccidiostat, so there was a reduced load of emeria, their animals were less infected, as you can see in this uh, graph here. So what we have seen in Europe in, in recent years is a big trend, a big push to move from coccidiostats to vaccination. And when we talk about vaccination, we know there are different types of vaccines. We have a live oocyst that can be provided as a vaccine that this could be attenuated or non-attenuated ones. Uh, the non-attenuated vaccines are, will be parasites that they have their original virulence. So the animals will have also compromised immune system by, by those vaccines, or we could have attenuated vaccines in which these parasites are adapted to become less virulent. As I mentioned before, vaccines need to, be, need to cover different species because the immunity is built by each Imeria species. So a good vaccine should contain, as I mentioned earlier, several uh, species to have a broad, broad protection. However, when we vaccinate birds, what we've, we have observed so far in our experiments at Schotters is that the body weight is usually reduced between 1 to 3 percent, and this is due to a reduction on feed intake. So it's well known when you have an activated immune system, the feed intake will also be reduced, and consequently, body weight could also be affected. Another predisposing factor that I mentioned already is nutrition. And if we look back on the literature, these are, this is literature from the 1990s in Norway, in which they control or they assessed the amount of barley and wheat being used in the, ration, in the, in the diets in relation to maize, here on the right side of the graph. And they found a big correlation between the use of barley and wheat, so very viscous grains, with necrotic enteritis problems. So you see here at the beginning of the 70s and, and the 80s, there were big peaks of necrotic enteritis when viscous grains were used. But at that time, you know that NSP enzymes were not present. So at the Schroders, we recently conducted a study, and we had several hypotheses for this study. And the first hypothesis was that vaccination against uh, coccidiosis could reduce the negative effect of necrotic enteritis. The second hypothesis we dealt with was that a combination between vaccines and some feed additives could have a synergistic effect on the intestinal health of uh, infected birds. And these hypotheses were tested in this experimental study that I'm going to show next. So we provided birds uh, started, uh, starter and finisher diets with wheat and enzyme, uh, plus enzymes, plus NSP enzymes, and also corn and around 23 to 37% of soybean meal. 
So birds were vaccinated uh, at the beginning of the study, uh, but then the, the clostridia was induced in the, during the grower phase. And in that grower phase, which we also call infectious period, wheat and barley were the only grains available and no NSP enzymes were added in order to stimulate viscosity. So if we look at the experimental setup, here we had uh, six different treatments. There was a negative control treatment with no vaccine and no necrotic enteritis challenge, a positive control with no vaccine but infection, and then treatment three to treatment six uh, birds were vaccinated and different feed additives were added in treatment four, five, and six. So in treatment four, vaccination was combined with MCFAs, the medium chain fatty acids. Treatment five, we provide vaccine plus uh, short chain fatty acids in feed. And treatment six, uh, essential oils were provided. So we had eight replicates per pen, so eight cages of broilers. And these are the results uh, we obtained before the challenge. Remember, birds were vaccinated at the beginning of the study, and clostridio was induced during the grower phase. So here we are looking again at the results before clostrid clostridia uh, infection. And as you can see, uh, clearly on body weight gain on FCR that the animals that received the vaccine had a lower body weight gain on FCR compared to the birds that did not receive the vaccine. You also observe some differences between the treatments that were vaccinated, but the most relevant studies are on the following phase during the challenging period, so during the grower phase. So here we see the clear reduction, sorry, clear reduction on body weight gain and increased FCR uh, in due to the, the challenge. However, the, all the birds that received the vaccine were able to have similar body weight, but that was not the case for FCR. If we look at feed efficiency, we observe that the animals that were vaccinated, they had a different response, being the treatment receiving MCFAs having a similar FCR than the animals that were not infected. If we look at the results after the challenge, so at the recovery phase, here we are looking at body weight on day 28 and day 42, we can see that the animals receiving the vaccine plus the medium chain fatty acids had a significantly higher body weight at day 28, especially compared to the, to the positive control treatment. But on day 42, sorry, we didn't, we didn't obtain any significant difference between treatments. But that's on body weight. If we look at the feed efficiency, if we look at the overall FCR, here the differences uh, appear again. So again, we didn't observe differences on body weight, on feed intake, but on FCR, again, the, oh, sorry, the treatment with the vaccine and MCFAs had the lowest FCR compared to the treatments that were also vaccinated or vaccinated with uh, short-chain fatty acids. So in conclusion of this study, vaccine was a, a very effective way to reduce uh, intestinal damage and promote growth rate, to growth performance. Vaccine offer partial protection against the negative effect of the clostridia, challenge on performance compared to the non-vaccinated uh, infected control and the combination of vaccine plus the medium chain fatty acids had a added value 
had a uh, yeah an positive effect in improving performance and reducing also the intestinal damage compared to the animals that received only the vaccine or the vaccine together in combination with SCFAs or essential oils. So with that, yeah, I would like to finalize my presentation and we'll be happy to, to take any questions you may have. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Roger. Really nice presentation. Uh, one, one question I, it came up with uh, at my side. Uh, they say vaccination, and you already said that as well, that vaccination can have a slight negative effect on, on uh, feed conversion. Yeah. So should we always take care uh, of trying to compensate the feed with like acids in this case? That's uh, hello? Yeah. So uh, that's totally true. Uh, it's well known as indicated when you have an activated immune system feed intake is being reduced so if you can get a vaccine that doesn't have this uh, negative effect that will be ideal mm -hmm. Other, uh, otherwise yeah to counteract this effect you can think of some ideas some feed additives that can stimulate or can compensate this uh, the ingestion however if you look also on the longer term <coughs> the animals will naturally Compensate. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. so over That's the whole, over the whole flock cycle, uh, you should be should be all right. I will expect so. Mm -hmm. yes. yes. All right. Yeah. I'm just looking into the audience. Is there a question for Roger in the back? I have a microphone. So one moment. I will come back to you. So. <laughs> Alfred Blanc, uh, Dimus, uh, congratulations for this uh, excellent study. Roger, I wanted to ask you about the uh, epithelium damage. You said uh, you had a positive effect, but you didn't show any data here. Uh, I guess this is stuff for your next presentation next time. And then I wanted to ask you, so you saw good results in terms of performance up to date 28. So usually uh, it takes some time after the challenging to recover the stairs, no? to heal the epithelium. Uh, the question is, based on your findings, what would you recommend? I mean, does it pay off to include such a medium chain fatty acid up to day 42, or you would supply it until day 28? Yep. That's, that's a good question, Alfred. Uh, thank you for your question. Um, yeah, I didn't have time to present all the results, so you're, you're right that uh, we also collect many intestinal samples, so we measure uh, lesion scores, so we obtain also similar trends compared to the to growth performance. Uh, and then, of course, medium chain fatty acids are a, an expensive feed additive. You can also consider including some ingredients that are rich on those. Uh, but if I need to, the question about uh, additive, yeah, I will mainly be feeding on the most challenging period. So uh, maybe the first three, four weeks should be enough. Yeah. Can I just sit down? Uh, the question is, uh, from, from your result, uh, we can see that the performance uh, of the uh, combination between vaccine and also the another fit additive, uh, it's better compared to the standalone vaccination. But uh, for me, according to the results, none of this combination with vaccine or with the uh, uh, medium chain fatty acid or with uh, another uh, molecule is uh, the best. So do you have any experience or research uh, to combine with the vaccine and also together not only with the standalone of the uh, like a medium chain fatty acid or essential oil, uh, do you have any research that combining the vaccine with the combination of those three uh, uh, or, 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 or just two, uh, the fit additive? Uh, that's a that's a very uh, good question. Uh, I mean, uh, as I said, at uh, this moment in Europe, we're starting doing this transition to become coccidiostat free to go into vaccination. This was a first good step to say, okay, we want to understand the effect of each additive by itself. Then the question, it's logic, and that's going to be the next step we're going to be dealing with is what are, what is the best combination of feed additives, feed composition. Uh, management uh, measures, so that will be more applicable. This is like a very pure, clean 
uh, infectious challenge. The next step, I agree, will make sense to do a more practical study to understand what's th what the best combination is. Enzymes, probiotics, uh, MCFAs, other key uh, ingredients will be interesting to evaluate for sure. Yeah, about the question is about cost efficiency. Of course, the most cost efficiency measure at this moment will be to provide coccidiostat. Then the market is, is moving to a vaccination. That's a trend and also retailers are asking for it. Uh, and then, yeah, I will say not only, not only thinking about nutrition, which still it's most relevant in my opinion, but thinking about management and making the most cost effective measure. Yeah, that's something we, we need to further study. Well, thank you uh, for uh, for answering the question, uh, Roger. Yep. Uh, and there is always room for extra research, of course. Right. Always, always. Uh, a big round of applause for Roger. Thank you very much. Thank you. Really good. It's my pleasure uh, to introduce the second speaker of today. Uh, Anna Karanczynska is a product manager of monogastrics at Christian Hansen and today she will give her insights in the power of the robust microbiome for, a health, uh, for the health of your business. So can these tiny microbes make our birds healthy, Anna? Thank you very much. Um, does it work? Microphone. Does it work? No? Yep. Yes. Thank you very much, Sawadika. And thank you, Fabian, for introducing me. I will try to answer these questions today. And thank you guys for coming to listen about the power of the robust microbiome that can impact the health, not only the health of the birds, but also the health of your business. So before we start, let me introduce a Christian Hansen uh, to you. Uh, many of you probably already heard, and I see some familiar faces, so thank you for coming. Um, how many of you had a yogurt or cheese today in the morning for breakfast? <laughs> Very good. More tricky question. How many of you had wine yesterday? <laughs> <laughs> I'm very happy to see it because you probably, at least in 50% of you, is supporting already Christian Hansen business. As our cultures are in every second cheese, and every second yogurt in the world. So in Christian Hansen, we are specialized in the microbial, microbial solution, but we use the powers of good bacteria for every aspect that is possible. We use them to uh, make food, make uh, ferment yogurt, uh, make cheese. We use them for wine. We use them also to protect the food, but we use the good bacteria also for the human probiotics, for the baby formulas, to protect the plants, to make them healthy and all and grow faster. And also, of course, that's why we are here. We use the good bacteria for, um, for our business, to make the birds, to make the um, animals, production animals more healthy. One more thing I would like to highlight is that uh, in Christian Hansen, we own the biggest commercial strain bank. It's more than 40,000 different strains that we have collected and described. And you may think, so what? It's just a number. But when we know what these bacteria are doing and what are their superpowers, we can easily take those that are the best for the current challenges in the market. So when we see the challenges coming, we can combine the strengths in the product that will be most efficient for you to tackle challenges you have currently. So we will cover today a few topics. What makes the microbiome important for our industry? and then answer the question, can these microbes make people happy? Can make the birds happy? Uh, and after, uh, after that, we'll uh, look if we can reveal some more information about the microbiome, because microbiome can be very abstractive. So can we know more, and can this knowledge help us? Let's have a look. So why microbiome is important? Uh, we are using microbes, and you are using, you are dealing with the uh, microbes since ages. We have them in our diets. They are in fermented cabbage, they are in fermented vegetables, in yogurts. So they 
exist. They are with us since, uh, already since a long time. Another funny thing is that in our body, it is estimated that there is more bacteria than our cells. So it's estimated that we may be 40% humans only, and the rest is bacteria. So they are important. We have to consider them. Uh, what can microbes do? Some inspiration from the human world. Um, the study that we are looking at is uh, the study made in human. There were two twins and the microbiome of those people were extracted and transplanted to the mouse. The mouse uh, mice were um, fed the same diet to eliminate this component that could vary. And what happened? The mouse that had the microbiota transplant from the obese twin became fat and the mouse that had the microbiota transplanted from the lean twin stayed lean. That means that the microbes can influence the body weight. So we may think, okay, should we take probiotics? They will make us fat. That's not true. This is another study from the human uh, medicine when um, people were su supplemented with the probiotics. So not only microbiota by itself, but it also was impacted uh, by probiotics. And people who had the major eating disorders, they were taking probiotics and their desire to eat and the hunger was modified in the way that it was desired. So these people, they gain weight and they became healthy. On the other hand, another study, this is a compilation of few stu studies, people with uh, overweight and obesity, they were also taking the probiotics and they were able to um, achieve the, body weight, uh, the BMI that was required, so they were able to lose weight. So basically, the conclusion is that microbiota, we can impact the microbiota and it can make us healthy. So you may think, okay, gut microbiota, body weight, obvious. Do you think that uh, microbes and the microbiome can impact any other organs or systems? What would be your guess? Which one do you think? Which systems? Immunity, yes. Yeah, very well. Thank you. Yes, the answer is yes, of course. And here we are still staying with, uh, with uh, human examples. We know that um, microbiome is much more studied in human than in uh, animals. We are just starting this knowledge. We are scratching the surface of this knowledge. And we know that the consequences of changes in the human gut microbiome may impact different diseases. It's well known that there is a correlation between the microbiome and Alzheimer, or for example, depression. As well, different allergies or uh, skin condition can be associated with the microbiome changes. Same for diabetes or different cardiovascular diseases. So, if this biosis can impact negatively these uh, conditions, imagine the power if the microbiome is robust. What could we do and what are the huge possibilities of bacteria to modify that? So I mentioned robust microbiome, thank you. What does it mean? What is the microbiome robustness? A microbiome robustness is the ability of the intestinal microflora to react to the changing condition because the conditions in the gut, they will always be challenged, they will always be changing, they are not constant. And we want this microbiome to stay balanced and productive because microbiome very often is called the forgotten organ because it produces different components. It's not only enzymes, it's not only antimicrobial factors, but also we know different hormones and different neurotransmitters are produced in the gut. Did you know that 90% of serotonin, which is the hormone of happiness, is produced in the gut? That's amazing. That's why we can be happy if our microbiota is happy. Um, so let's go now to the chicken because this is the topic of the day. Uh, microbiome robustness is at risk constantly. Chicken are constantly exposed to different stress, like for example the heat stress or the pathogenic challenges, like you mentioned before, for example the Clostridia challenge or Salmonella E. coli. Antibiotic therapy is another component that can negatively impact 
uh, the microbiome, microbiome robustness. The same when we talk about the nutritional factors. Why do we want to have the robust microbiome? The robust microbiome is equal better intestinal health. And the better intestinal health, the healthier the birds are, the better they perform. We can also impact the food safety with the healthy microbiome because the birds are more resistant to the challenges. We can look, we can impact animal welfare and behavior. And at the end, all of that leads to improved and increased production profitability. And this is the core of uh, our business. So let's have a look at animal performance. This is the study we like to call the big versus small birds. And in this study, we have looked at 200 broiler chicken. Uh, there was no additive in this study, but we have seen that in the same condition, the same flock, there was a huge, huge variability between the body weight uh, of the birds at day 37. Some of them were one and a half kilogram, and some of them were twice more heavy. So we wanted to see if this is associated somehow with the microbiome. We took the samples from the 25 heaviest and the 25 uh, lightest birds. We took the intestinal sample, we extracted the microbiome, and we sequenced this microbiome. And what we have noticed is that in the big birds, the microbiome was uh, much more diverse. So there was more bacteria, different bacteria in the microbiome, which is good because we want the microbiome to be robust and diverse. And secondly, when we look at the uniformity, and this is what you see on the graph, this complicated graph on the right side, the blue one are the big birds, the blue dots, the uniformity of the microbiome of the big birds was much closer, so they were much more uniform. While we look at the small birds, it was all over the place. And that follows the uh, principle of Anna Karenina that says that all, mm, all the robust microbiome look alike, but all dysbiosis, dysbiotic microbiome and unhealthy, are dysbiotic in its own way. That tells us that if there are certain conditions, we can have a robust microbiome. And when we don't have a robust microbiome, when there is a dysbiosis, the microbiome is not functioning and is very fragile. So, now the question, can they make birds happy and performing? We were talking, uh, the answer was uh, in front of you, because we know that it, uh, the microbiota impacts animal welfare and behavior. And here is another study I would like to show uh, to you, where we had a control group, and then we had a group of birds that we fed with uh, galliprofit. This is a triple strain poultry uh, probiotics from Christian Hansen. We have looked at different parameters. First of all, we look at the welfare parameters. We made a uh, few tests, and one of them is called approximation test. Approximation test is, is the test when we try to touch the birds in a certain time, and we see how do they behave. Can they be touched, or do they escape, so how anxious they are. We uh, observed that uh, birds fed uh, with galliprofit, the more birds in that group could be touched, so they were much more calmer. And you may think, okay, maybe this is some external condition, maybe the barn, whatever, some external factors. So we said, okay, let's look if we can measure that and we can look at some concrete parameters. We took the blood samples from those animals and we measure serotonin, that is a hormone of happiness. We also measure the corticosterone, which is a hormone of stress. And we observe that in the calmer birds fed with probiotic, the higher level, the serotonin level was four times higher. We can say they were four times more happy. At the same time, the corticosterone level was half lower, so less stressed. And you might say, okay, happy birds, better serotonin, but we still need to produce protein. We need to earn money. Is it translated to the performance? Yes. Uh, also, as you can see, the uh, group fed with galliprofit had better FCR. We look even farther in the um, gut morphology, and we have seen there was a 23% higher absorption surface, so the um, crypt villi ratio was higher. That means the more nutrients could be absorbed by birds, and that's probably explaining part of this uh, performance improvement. 
Okay, we know microbiome is important, we know it's correlated somehow with the performance, but can we know if the microbiome of your birds currently, today, is good or bad? Can we have an insight and look deeper and reveal this knowledge that is not seen at the first sight? So the microbiota analysis results can be very, very complex. There are multiple parameters we can look at. Is a taxonomy composition, alpha diversity, beta diversity, Shannon index, other indexes that I cannot even pronounce. So um, microbiome analysis, really complex and require um, expertise. In Christian Hansen, we look, we take a samples, we look at all these parameters and to make it useful for the industry, and for you, we put all of that in the machine learning and we have developed one index that can indicate you the current status of your flock. And this is called robustness index. And the robustness index is a simply and easy way to summarize basically this gut microbiota and all these parameters that we're talking about. It's, um, it shows us if there is a high risk of dysbiosis currently or low risk of dysbiosis. So it's very, very simplicated. <coughs> Robustness Index is a part of IRIS. This is a new service from Christian Hansen that we have launched um, in Europe, in US, and currently we are uh, extending to other regions like Asia. And IRIS is a combination of analysis, but also assessment of the microbiome and then going further, advices uh, for the producers. Um, the IRIS translates this complexity to this one index that we have mentioned, the robustness index, and then we can know what's happening. We can take the decisions faster and we can have a sustainable animal performance at the end. So IRIS reveals the knowledge that we didn't see. Artificial intelligence help us uh, to interpret that. We can avoid losses because we can easily monitor the microbiome and um, take the decisions that are based by data. So it's not guessing anymore. We have data concrete showing us what's happening and if the strategy, for example, the feeding strategy or additive that you plan to use is working. So just to summarize, because I see zero in front of me, gut health has an impact on the production profitability. Microbiome robustness is the pillar of the gut health. And the analysis can be very complex, but we can simplify it with IRIS. And IRIS is the easy choice to help you to act faster and be more efficient in the production. So if there is any more questions later on, I would like to invite you to our booth, which is in Hall 3, booth number 4410. And then we can speak more deep about um, about those topics. As well, there are two technical bulletins that are um, in front of the room that you can take. One is describing more deeper the study about the big birds and the small birds. Sorry. And another one is um, about the robustness index. Well, thank, you. thank you for your presentation, Anna. Thank you very much. Really good and good timing as well. Good to hear that microbiota can make us happy and that when we are happy we perform well and grow well so I have a great excuse when I come home for <laughs> eating too much this week <laughs> uh, Eat your microbiota well <laughs> exactly uh, I, I have a question um, if, we, if we know the microbiome composition of a bird um, could we predict its performance in advance that's a very good question so let me give you a little bit of background about how we developed iris while we were developing iris, we collected the samples of Sika, we isolated the microbiome, of course, but we also collected the data from the farm. So the final performance of birds, FCR, different parameters, the uh, different uh, challenges that happen. So the more information we have, the more we can feed the artificial intelligence, the machine learning model, mm -hmm. and then the more information and the more accurate we can be. And we see the correlation between robustness index and the FCR. Mm -hmm. So. It's coming soon, and it's there. I mean, we see it. It would be a great tool to have to predict body weight at the end of the, pro uh, the flux cycle, of course. But That's one, another One step. more question from my side before I go to the audience. Um, in your opinion, uh, you have a lot of experience with a lot of different uh, probiotics, um, but would all 
probiotics have an impact uh, on the microbiome in a positive way? Or is there a risk as well? That's a tricky question. Because all probiotics are not the same. Looking at uh, Bacillus subtilis strains, mm. we know there is more than 1,000 Bacillus subtilis. Same name, same surname, we can call it like that. So the population is very big and they differ. They have different superpowers. It's like a human population between us. If you would need to have a football team mm -hmm. and you would need a goalkeeper, would you choose me for the goalkeeper? Well, I like you, but no. <laughs> Thank you. Because I don't have the superpowers. It's the same with the bacillus strains. We choose the one that is fitting our current challenges and it's solving these current, current challenges. So we know that Christian Hansen probiotics, they can modify the microbiome in the positive way. Mm -hmm. That's I can state. All right. Uh, a question from the audience? Yeah, one moment. Can I have the microphone, please? Thank you. Here you are. Just wait a moment. I think it is. Try the other one. With my mic. Take two. This one works, I'm sure. Hi, Anna. Thank you. Very interesting presentation. Um, could you elaborate a bit on the uh, Eris service, is it, um, the practical yeah. implementation in the field and in what region? Please. Thank you. Yes, sure. Thank you for that question. So, as mentioned before, Iris was uh, first uh, launched in uh, Europe, so we have the most experience from the Europe. Of, of course, before launching, we also had uh, a lot of beta tester data. And one of the uh, first customers uh, he was facing E. coli challenges. And he wanted to implement the new strategy to get rid of this, uh, the new feeding strategy to get rid of this um, issue. So um, he implemented the new additive and he wanted to make sure that this additive is working and has an impact on the microbiome to make it stronger when the challenge is coming that the birds can defend themselves. So here we use uh, iris and the iris confirm that this new feeding strategy can bring the benefits. Um, by that, the customer had no doubt and he could implement this uh, strategy faster, having a significant cost saving. Because we could see, we could observe the uh, FCR improvement, uh, less condemnation at the slaughterhouse, and also uh, less antibiotic use. All right, thanks for answering. Uh, room for one more sm small question. Uh, I'm just curious about the broiler trial. Uh, with happy hormone. With a happy happiness, yeah, with happy a serotonin. Yeah, yeah. Uh, where did you conduct the trial? Excuse me? Where did you conduct the trial? It was in Brazil, this one. Ah, okay, uh, it's nice. It's hot there. Yes. <laughs> because uh, I want to know, because uh, it's hot in Thailand and, and even in the Philippines. We have more uh, information about this uh, trial captured also in uh, the article, so I will be very happy to share it with you and you can see the more details. And uh, I'm happy to visit your booth. Thank you very much. You're very welcome. Well, thank you very much. Thank you, Anna. A big round of applause for Anna. Thank you. Thank you. There you are. Well, that already uh, clicker. Ah. Good. That <laughs> already brings to, uh, uh, us to our third speaker of today, uh, Fairin uh, Sidik. And Fairin is a technical manager at IFF, and he will share his knowledge on elevating poultry gut, uh, uh, poultry gut health in a post-AGP era. Quite interesting topic. He will uh, address field challenges as well as discuss practical approaches to tackle the challenges. Fairin, the stage is yours. Yeah, thank you so much, Fabian. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, yeah, my talk will be very r strongly related what Anna and also Roger already delivered because it's really related with the digestibility, microbiome, and also the immunity. And the good thing, uh, I mean, the good thing about the uh, the absence of the AGP, right? We we it may deliver a good thing about sustainability and also about the uh, antimicrobial uh, microbial resistance, but. The, the animal also becoming more susceptible with the any kind of challenges that the 
Yeah. I'm going to address some challenges that we uh, observe in normally in the fields here. Some some of the challenges that nor normally f see in, in, in the field here is the on the low nutrient digestibility. So it's very relevant with the current situation, especially in the in the region, right? When the industry try to uh, tend to use more and more f uh, alternative ingredients, so it is has more it impacted on the. I'm sorry. Impacted on the anti nutrition in increasing of the anti nutritional factor, the anti nutritional factor that it will impact also on, on the uh, increasing undigested uh, nutrient fractions that will uh, save the uh, microbial population as well. The second, the second challenge that we we'll also see is on the bacteriosis. I think it's also mentioned by Roger and Anna about this this dysbiosis. So. The, uh, it's normally impacted by the pathogenic bacteria and also the coxie that it will impact on the expensive therapeutic treatment. And the last one is on the uh, weak immune system. The immune system is uh, highly demanding on the energy requirement, so we need to manage it very well. And it, al it always divert the energy from the growth. So that's the thing that we don't want to have because it will impact on the uh, uh, less efficiency on the, on the life production cycle. That's why to answer that kind of challenges, we are uh, we need to have a strategy to shift from the unfavorable nutribiotic state to the favorable nutribiotic state. So the nutribiosis is actually the interactions between uh, nutrition, microbiome, and also uh, gut and immune function. From the nu nutrition side, right, we are very concerning on the improving of the digestibility improve and also together to improve the uh, energy utilization. So we try to remove or eliminate as much as possible in terms of the uh, undigested nutri nutrients or anti-nutritional factor. On the microbiome side, we are focusing on the increasing the beneficial bacterial populations. At the same time, we try to decrease non-beneficial and opportunistic bacteria. That those two will impact as well on the uh, intestinal integrity and structure. I think that one is very important on the uh, maintaining the gut integrity because it, it is the first line of defense of the animal, especially for the bird. And also, we are we we are will be more talking more about the uh, inflammatory response. We we when when we're talking about the on the healthiness of uh, uh, the healthiness of the chicken is not only on the microbiome but also we tr we have we have to see on the inflammatory response as well. Yeah, from our internal survey in Danisco Animal Nutrition and Health, we see that um, most of the in, uh, alternative ingredients, for example, here from the sunflower meal and rice bran, we see that the high level of the total arabinosilence, or the substrate is there. But uh, that's the challenge that we need to uh, answer, right? And also, it's not only arabinosilence, but on the undigested protein fractions, it's all, it also has high impact, I mean, high content of the undigested group protein fractions. Imagine if there's abundance of the undigested uh, uh, nut nutrient fractions, it will be uh, good for the opportunistic bacteria or the pathogenic bacteria. They will, they will thrive more and the good bacteria will have uh, less room to grow or thrive. So that factor that needs to be considered if the anti-nutritional factor present first is on the physiological challenges and second on the low digestibility capability. I think that one is very very important. I mean, this, the previous statement is strongly related with the, this data that we see that are relevant between the total arabinosilent and also the FCR. The higher of the fiber or the total arabinosilent here, ar arabinosilent here, it impact on it has negative impact on the FCR, or it will reduce the uh, efficiency of the uh, productions. So, the answer always: uh, How should we remove or eliminate the uh, anti-nutritional factor, especially on the total arabinosilence. The most practical way that industry is uh, doing now is by using enzymes. The, it, it's very easy. I mean, uh, when we want, the enzyme is working very specific on the substrate, and we have arabinosilence, abundant arabinosilence on the alternative ingredients. So we have silanase to break down the uh, arabinosilence, and that will uh, we, we will sift or convert the complex arabinosilin to be more simple form, which is arabinosilin oligosaccharide, and it can be a substrate or become like kind of pro prebiotics evac for the uh, a good bacteria to thrive. At the same time, it will reduce the 
box effect. I mean, normally when there is arabinoxyl in there and the protein and also starch, it's a very uh, res becoming more resistant to the uh, endogenous enzyme. So when arabinoxyl is eliminated, then uh, the starch and also the protein is becoming easier for the endogenous enzyme like protease or amylase together to attack the specific substrate. From our study, from uh, the uh, uh, meta-analysis that we have conducted from 184 study here, we, we see pretty interesting. I mean, it is not, on, on the, on not only in the digestibility imp improvement when using enzyme, but also we also see on the uniformity. I think Anna also mentioned about the variability of the production, right? So I think that's very nice. I mean, we also see the same. And we, uh, by using enzyme, especially the uh, combination of silanase, amylase, and protease, we, ca we not only expect on the improve improvement of the digestibility, but also for the uniformity. So here, the uniformity improves uh, tr dramatically by 27% on the protein, and on the starch, it's improved very high, up to 38% uh, on the uh, uh, reducing the variability of the performance. So the, us the usage of enzyme as well that uh, we can expect on the uh, nutrient uh, utilization, especially on the energy. Here we can see uh, both in this soy, uh, corn soy based diet or the more complex diet, there is the improvement of the energy utilization by improving the energy digestibility by uh, 170 until 180 kcal per kilogram of the feed. The same thing, the same trend that we also observe on the crude protein digestibility, it can improve by 7%, both in the corn soy based diet or on the complex uh, diet. So the second things that we, we would like to address as well is on the pathogenic bacterial challenges. So one of our solutions that we have in uh, our portfolio is the combination of the essential oil. I think uh, this one is uh, very uh, strategic to have as well since uh, the com we need to find the best combination uh, in this case with thymol and cinnamaldehyde. So we, with thymol, normally it will interact with the bacterial membrane, so it will uh, disrupt the uh, bacterial membrane. And for this uh, cinnamaldehyde, it is uh, pretty specific to uh, interact with the specific enzyme that working on the uh, uh, bacterial cellular production or the ATP generation. So we can, so this combination is very effective on on the pathogenic inhibitions. So we also see by using uh, uh, essential oil with the right combinations, we can expect there is a good sieve in terms of the pathogenic bacteria. But at the same time, for the beneficial bacteria, we can see that there is a higher uh, population of the uh, good bacteria in this case. Yeah, good specifically if we see that uh, the, uh, the effect of the es combination of essential oil to the pathogenic bacteria like Clostridium perfringens or E. coli, it, it can reduce that its population, but at the same time, the use of the perfect combinations, it can, Im it can uh, uh, improve the population of the beneficial bacteria like Bifidobacterium or Lactobacillus in this case. Yeah, one other parameter that we also uh, observe here when we are when we are talking about the uh, healthiness of the chicken is also the production of short chain fatty acid. And here, especially on the butyric, here the usage of uh, uh, NVIO or the combination of the uh, essential oil, we can see that the improvement by 47% on the day 20, and it is very consistent. At the uh, later age, at the 40 days, we can exactly see uh, almost the same pattern that the improvement about 43% for the butyric uh, acid production on the intestine. We also try to see the combination between essential oil together with the enzyme. Uh, here on the body weight gain on the 42 days, right, we can see that there is clearly improvement on the uh, body weight gain, especially by the combination. We can see here there is the significant improvement by 19% of the body weight gain. The same thing for the FCR. Since body weight gain is improved a lot, then the FCR also uh, uh, significantly drop and it can deliver about 14% of the FCR improvement. The interesting uh, that we also see, because we measure on the salmonella positive on the in, in the seca, so we can see here that the usage of uh, essential oil and also to get uh, and also with uh, a standalone salinase or uh, essential oil is actually give 
a very good reduction on the salmonella positive samples, but when we combine it, 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 it gives a, a, a better response on that part. We also compare with the, uh, how the uh, essential oil is working when, com when comparing with the uh, antibiotic in this case. So we can see if we compare it to uh, uh, antibiotic in this case, the essential oil or its combination with probiotic can deliver a better daily gain and also a better FCR by uh, two point improvement compared to the uh, antibiotic. So last but not least, on the immune development, I think we, are, we try to uh, see this more and more, right? Since we, we see that immune system disruptions is demanding really high energy. So from, from this data, we can clearly see the higher duration score, it actually requires higher maintenance of the energy. So imagine when we have this and we uh, put, put uh, a very uh, low safety margin in the formulation and we have this for example, 1.5 or 2, two point relation score, then all the maintenance energy will go for only uh, uh, the immune uh, maintenance only and less for the retention or for the productions. And from that, we try to capture how the uh, essential oil or enzyme can uh, work and uh, give the best solution on that. So from, from our data, we can see the the usage of the a gradual dose of the essential oil, it actually impacted very positive on the macrophage activity. You can see here. And the, the key role for macrophage is to consume the bacteria and train the immune system to be able to attack the bacterial invader. So it's kind of kind of like, like uh, the first line of defense when there is a bacteria in, 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 in the systemic. One other parameter that we also normally see is on the signaling. So there are numbers of signaling when we're talking about the immune system, but the two major signaling that we observe normally is uh, on the pro-inflammatory and also the anti-inflammatory. On the pro-inflammatory, we see that the, uh, the, the usage of the essential oil with the gradual dose is very effective on reducing the pro-inflammatory signaling like interleukin-8 and interleukin-6, but at the same time, it improved the anti-inflammatory. So it helped the chicken recover faster and recover better since it provides the good environment for the, uh, for the chicken to uh, have a better uh, recovery and more efficient. So. Uh, that bring me to the end of my uh, presentation. Uh, to summarize, to give, the, to provide the uh, active protection for uh, our bird, and the holistic approach is need to be taken to sustain the GIT health, especially in, in the post AGP era that we are we tr we we are not using uh, AGP anymore. Maybe in the near future, and also the perfect combination of uh, from our research of enzyme and essential oil is very effective on improving poultry health and performance. And last but not least, the immune system respond to battle the infections. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you so much for your presentation. You're sharing a lot of data. Um, let's go to the audience for a question first. And don't worry, I will test the microphone. See, I have to test it. But no questions from the audience? Uh, I have one uh, I was writing uh, with your presentation. Yeah, sure. um, w when it comes to uh, improving di uh, digestion with, uh, with enzymes, um, what would be the, the effect on, on, on overall uh, improving the gut health status? Yeah. I think we are uh, talking more on this part, right? I mean, Roger also said, as, uh, confirming with the same data, that uh, actually what the, the, the current of industry now, that because of the price pressure, price pressure of the ingredient, we mm -hmm. use a lot of the alternative ingredient. For example, like right. we utilize more rice bran, even in Thailand, they, they we try to utilize for the paddy rice, right, for the, uh, uh, for the alternative ingredient. So, but at the same time, it is good to have the alternative. But at the same time, when we analyze, we see that a lot of uh, I mean, high content of the anti-nutritional factor. They're impacted not only on the digestibility, they're also impacted on the gut health as well. So by, by removing all those kind of a hurdle, mm. we can have the better uh, immune response or 
uh, immune status at the end of the day. All right, yeah. uh, makes sense. Um, another question, you, you shared some, some results on, on combination uh, solutions, right? Uh, and uh, we had this question before, how does that relate to uh, improvement in efficiency and cost hmm. factor on the other side? Yeah, that's a very interesting one because we always try, every time we do the uh, research or the trial, but, but in the global or the regular scale, we always try to calculate the ROI, whether hmm. it is acceptable or not to go to industry, right? That's hmm. why on the uh, enzyme side, we always see uh, how we can utilize, I mean, when on the enzyme, we normally liberate the nutrients, right? The nutrients like from the complex uh, uh, fiber to the more uh, utilizable uh, nutrients. For example, we can spare some of the energy. So from right. that, we can actually uh, reformulate and get lower uh, feed cost. But at the same time, we also see uh, how the, for example, the essential oil or probiotic has, has the significant effect on the performance. So we, it, at the end of the day, there is uh, a, a good improvement, so we can calculate on the mm -hmm. ROI side. So yeah, yeah. yeah, we also we all we uh, our benchmark always on the AGP, but I think it is become new normal for the performance is even better than the AGP. Especially when we move away yes. from AGP, yes. makes so makes perfect sense. Well, thank you very much. Yeah. A question from the audience here in the front. Mm. Yeah, works. Double checking. Uh, thank you for better. <coughs> Uh, presentation. You mentioned better immune response to increase the number of microphages or, or the extending the microphages for better, uh, better uh, response. Uh, can you repeat the question, sir? Like <coughs> you mentioned the better response uh, uh, to battle the infection. Incre I'm, my question is that macrophage is a mediated immunity. Uh, it's a number of macrophages increase or the extending of the macrophages increase? Ah, yeah, yeah. Uh, the response always, uh, we always see the response when we uh, apply the combination, especially enzyme or essential oil. Normally it improves the, uh, we, we, we don't only see the on the pathogenic bacteria, but also but al we, we also try to capture how it also, uh, the good pac the, how the good bacteria thriving as well. So we, we, we measure on the, uh, pathogenic bacteria sift as well, but also the good bacteria like Bifidobacterium and Lactobacillus uh, population uh, uh, in, in overall. So I think we, we, s we saw that it's, uh, it's a very positive effect on, on those two. Well, thank you. Yeah. Thank you for explaining, uh, yeah. Faye. Thank Thanks. you so much, Faye. Super. That brings me to the last speaker of uh, today. Ah, the slide is already on. Uh, Dr. Alain Gérigy is a Global Species Manager at uh, Poultry at uh, Fileo. And in his presentation, he will explain uh, how a stronger gut leads to a greater feed efficiency. And as I understand it, it's all about tight junctions. Or is there more to it? Please go ahead. So, hello, I'm working for Filio. Filio is the animal nutrition business unit of Le Saf. Le Saf is a French family-owned company which is 170 years old this year and we are celebrating the event this afternoon on our booth at 5 p.m. so you are all invited to come on our booth. So, uh, a few minutes ago Anna spoke about cheese but when we speak about bread, uh, I think you all eat bread uh, we can estimate that uh, one third in this room are eating bread coming fr made from uh, yeast, made from uh, uh, coming from the the strains of uh, of le saf. So uh, I will speak about stronger gut and greater feed efficiency. Uh, in fact, I will speak about uh, ActiSaf. We are launching ActiSaf in poultry this year, and I will explain how ActiSaf can help make the gut stronger and how it can help improve the feed efficiency. In fact, Le, uh, ActiSaf is a, a product which is used for a long time in ruminant and swine, 
and we are uh, tri uh, beginning to do some trials in, in poultry. Enfin, we are not beginning because we did we already started uh, uh, one or two years ago with very uh, uh, interesting trials. But uh, um, uh, we have good results, and I will explain why it is interesting to position uh, Actisaf also in poultry now. So Alt uh, Actisaf is made from uh, uh, selected proprietary strain uh, SC47. It's a unique microspheral form which makes the yeast resistant to pelletization. Uh, it, uh, we, we control all the manufac manufacturing process of the product. We are keeping on working uh, to do trials to, to prove the efficacy of the product. And we are also proposing a service which is the feed tech service to be able to, to check if the Actisaf used in the feed mills of our customers can resist to their pelletization process. So uh, the first question was, uh, uh, is Actisaf resistant in the, the, the feed uh, the, the poultry feed, uh, the, uh, the pelletization process in, in poultry. Uh, in fact, we did a, re a trial recently in France, uh, and we tested uh, three different batches, and, in and we included an amount of uh, at least log seven in each feed, and we applied different uh, pelletization process with different temperatures, 75 degrees, 85 degrees, or 90 degrees. And the threshold was uh, it, uh, to say that the live yeast is resistant, it's uh, that we lose less than one log. And you see in the res results that each time we lose an less than one log, it means that Atisaf, in such a very uh, stressful condition for, condition for the live yeast, the, 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 the yeast is quite resistant uh, in a pellet feed. So, how Actis Actisaf can help enhance the digestibility? There are many parameters that we can measure. We are focusing here on the support of the tight junction, the effect, the anti-inflammatory effect of the product, how it can increase the absorption areas to have a better dig digestibility, and also how it can help modulate the uh, microbiota with an increased community diversity. So, let's speak first about the gut integrity with the, the anti-inflammatory effect of the product. If you look at the two parameters on the left, which are pro-inflammatory pro parameters, we see that when we use Actisaf, these parameters are reduced. If you look at this parameter, the IL-10, which is an anti-inflammatory interleukin, this interleukin is improved, if I increased. It means that uh, uh, Actisaf helps reduce the inflammation level in the gut, and it's quite important in the modern poultry farming today because the birds are selected to, uh, to eat more, and of course it increases the chronic inflammation in the gut, and if we can reduce this chronic inflammation, it's good to have uh, for, the, for the gut health of the animals. Then, one of, one of the consequences of the inflammation is the impact of the tight on the tight junction. You know the tight junction are quite important to keep the space between the enterocytes are as narrow as possible to avoid passage of bacteria. And uh, um, in this trial, we measured the gene expression of one of the protein composing the tight junction, the occludin, and we see that in this trial, the gene expression was improved. It means that we had a better integrity of the tight junction. Then we measured the gut morphology. With uh, Aptisaf, we see that in this trial done in China, the height of the villi was increased, and also in the same time, the ratio between the crypt depths uh, and the villus height was increased. It means that if you have a lower inflammation, there is a lower need to replace the enterocytes, and these cells are coming from the crypts. So if there is a lower inflammation, we will need less uh, replacement with new cells, so the crypt will be shorter. It's why this ratio is re uh, improved uh, with Actisaf. Then, uh, thanks to a lower inflammation, thanks to uh, higher villi, so uh, more surface abs of absorption of nutri nutrients, in fact, we see that we have a better digestibility of the feed with concerning the 
crude protein, but also concerning the organic matter. And last but not least, uh, another pa very interesting parameter uh, for, the, for gut health is microbiota. It's a wide subject, so already explained by, uh, by um, uh, uh, the previous uh, presentation, but here, in fact, we focus on the alpha, alpha diversity. Uh, in this trial done in China, they measured several index. There are many indexes. Some of them are used to measure the richness of the, di of, of the microbiota, and some of them are uh, 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 measured to, to, to for the evenness of the microbiota. So, and these two parameters help measure the alpha, alpha diversity of the microbiota. Uh, so, but first, what is the richness? The richness, if you have a farm, the richness is how many spe different species you have in, of in your farms. If you have cows, if you have pigs, if you have broilers, you have many species, you have a, a good richness in your farm. And the evenness is the abundance, I mean, uh, how many birds do you have, how many cows, how many pigs, etc. So, and if a, higher, uh, a better richness and a better evenness means a better alpha diversity. And if you look at all the parameters, in fact, in the active supplementing group, we see that this uh, index were increased, so it means that HACTISAF helped improve the alpha diversity in this, in this trial. So, lower inflammation, increased absorption, surface, improved digestibility, and higher microbiota diversity help improve the feed efficiency. So, what is the benefit for, th for the farmers? It's a higher body weight and a lower feed conversion. And we see in the following trials how we can have improvement of this uh, of the body weight and the feed conversion. I will show four trials. This first one was done two years ago in China. Uh, they supplemented the birds during all the trials with ActiSAF at two different doses, 500 gram and 1 kg per ton. And uh, they measured the body weight and the feed conversion. The body weight was improved and the feed conversion was reduced in this trial. Then, more recently, last year, we did another trial also in controlled condition in the United States, in the University in Texas. But we applied a mild nutritional challenge. In fact, the birds were vaccinated at a double dose of coccidiosis vaccine. Then, the, the, they, they have put 5% of DDGs in the, in the feed formula, and they have placed the birds, the birds on a used litter. Uh, already contaminated with Clostridium, Emeria, etc. So, if you place the old tricks, fragile, on this kind of litter, it's challenging for the gut of the animals. So, it's why we can consider this uh, trial as a mild nutritional challenge. And they measured the performances of the birds during all the trial, and they tested two different doses, 375 and 500 grams per ton. So, if you look at the body weight, at 35 days, 42 days, 49 days, the body weight was improved in the active groups. Then, if we look at the feed conversion rate, this, conver this feed conversion was improved at 42 days in the, in the two active group groups compared to the control group. Uh, there was also, I forgot to say, an antibiotic group with a bacitracin. And at seven, day, uh, sev uh, seven weeks old, uh, the fit convention was uh, also improved uh, compared to the control group. And recently, we also did a second trial in the same facility, which confirmed this trial in the United States. Then, uh, uh, we are doing also some field trial to show the efficacy in the real condition. And in Eastern Europe, we uh, did a trial in a farm where we have two houses, each house with 50,000 broilers, and they used ActiSAF at 400 grams per ton. Then 
what they saw, they saw an improvement of the body weight, about uh, yeah, almost 170 grams more, a reduction of the feed conversion by five points. Then they saw a reduced mortality by 1.5% and also an improvement of the European Performance Index, which is a combination between the daily weight gain, the survivability and the fit conversion. And we see that this performance index was improved by uh, 44 points. And in this field condition, we measured the return on investment and we got a return on investment for 8 to 1. And uh, what is also important is that they did a second round for this trial on the same facility and they got, they got the same results. So we were very, of course, very happy to see that. And um, so I, I presented the results on, uh, on conventional broilers, but we know that there are some opportunities, especially in Asia, with local breeds. Uh, uh, we did this trial in Vietnam with local breeds, which are long living birds. They are growing slowly, uh, more than nine or 10 weeks, and they, uh, the body weight is low at the end, 1.2 kilograms only, compared to two or three kilograms for the conventional broilers. In China also, they are producing what they call the yellow broilers. It's uh, um, the same kind of breed and also slow growing birds. And I think there are good opportunities to test Actisaf in such a condition. Uh, this is what was done in this, in this trial in Vietnam two years ago. Uh, so they tested Actisaf at one kilogram per ton during nine weeks. And the body weight was improved by uh, about 100 grams, which represents uh, eight or nine percent of body weight more, which is quite important. The feed conversion was reduced by 14 points, also a strong reduction of the feed conversion, and the mortality was reduced by 2.5%. Uh, so, um, uh, even if the dose perhaps uh, was high in such a condition, 1 kg per ton, I think, I think we can get also these results with lower dose, as we saw on the conventional broilers at uh, 375 gr grams per ton in the trial done in the US. So, um, we saw that if we pr improve the gut health with uh, uh, reduction of the inflammation, with more surface absorption of the nutrient, with uh, better integrity of the tight junction, in fact, we can improve the feed digestibility, so the feed efficiency, and uh, at the end, it helps improve the product, uh, the, the production uh, performances. We recommend for Actisaf a dose of uh, between 375 and 500 grams per ton, depending on the condition and the stress of the animal, we can adapt the dose. And the take-home message are that Actisaf is made from a strain, a C47, which is a proprietary strain belonging to the SAF. This strain, this product is resistant to the, uh, the stressful condition of the pelletization process in the fin mills producing the poultry feed. Uh, we have proven the efficacy with scientific trials, but also in the field. So we have a better feed efficiency we have better performances on the animals, and of course, the most important, that we can help improve the income of the farmers. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Alain. Really nice presentation with a lot of details. But you made my life more challenging, because now, maybe tomorrow morning with breakfast, I have to choose between bread or yogurt, <laughs> or both. Or water, just water, fruits, or cheese, suggestions, suggestions. <laughs> well, but thank you very much for your presentation. Um, you just, in the last slide, you touched upon uh, uh, Actisaf in the feed mill, right? Um, is, is this probiotic based on 100% on live yeast 
or is it coated or mixed with a carrier to make processing easier? This product is 100% live yeast. There is no carrier, okay. no coating. Mm -hmm. uh, it's why it also makes this product active very quickly in the gut. Mm -hmm. There is no need to digest the coating of the product before uh, let, let the product being uh, uh, active in, in the gut. Mm. Uh, so it's uh, uh, and it uh, and we obtain this uh, this product thanks to a patented uh, drain process. Mm -hmm. But then is it is it resistant to pelleting, for instance, where heat is is in, in yes, introduced? Yes. Yes. So uh, and we showed that specifically in this uh, in this condition uh, because we tested for a long time the resistance of Actisaf. In uh, in ruminant feed, but mm -hmm. we know that the pellets are different. They are uh, bigger. That the diameter is uh, bigger. So it's and for in poultry feed, the diameter of the pellets are smaller. Right. It's why we wanted to check the, the resistance also in this condition. Mm -hmm. And uh, as you saw, we 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 have at le uh, each time less than uh, one log, even only 0 0.5 log, which is a, a, a few uh, um, uh, loss. Mm -hmm. for the number of the live yeast yeah. in, in the feed. So it, stay, it stays resistant, so it will stay active for, uh, to be active in the game. All right, well, that's really good to, uh, good to hear. I just have a look at the audience. Is there a question from, from one of you guys? No? Well, then, thank you very much. A round of applause for, for Alain. Thank, thank you. you. <laughs> thank you very much. Well, that brings us to the end of, uh, of this seminar. I really uh, want to express my gratitude to the speakers of today, uh, Roger, uh, Fayin, Anna, and of course Alain. Thank you for, uh, for, for being here and giving these clear-cut presentations. Uh, thank you for you as an audience as well. Uh, it was great to have you here, and I heard some, some good questions, and I'm happy we could address them. Uh, it was my pleasure to have you all here as a guest of Poultry World, uh, and I invite you to keep an eye out uh, on our website uh, for, for future webinars, seminars, and so on. So thank you again from myself, uh, the whole Michette team, uh, and I wish you a, fast a fantastic stay in, uh, in Bangkok. Thank you very much.